Okay, hello everyone. Uh, welcome back to our lecture series on historical memories of the Asia-Pacific War in East Asia. Today we're going to be taking a look at how memories of the war have changed throughout the post-war period uh, in Japan. And we'll be seeing uh, some of the different events and uh, looking at how the socio-historical uh, background influenced the construction of Japanese war memory uh, throughout this 70-year period. So, Memories of the Asia-Pacific War in Japan is the title of this talk, and I want to start by looking at the immediate post-war and occupation period, a uh, period of seven years when the Allies, the Allied powers mainly uh, under the auspices of the United States, occupied Japan and totally uh, and, and set about to totally reform uh, its society and political structure. Uh, and under the slogan of uh, democratization and demilitarization. And within that, in regards to war memory, uh, <clears throat> the general headquarters under the Civil Information and Education Division especially uh, launched a, a many different programs that were designed to basically inform the Japanese public uh, about what was really going on in the war, because throughout so much of the war, uh, the imperial headquarters and the Japanese government uh, had not really published the full details of what had been going on. So the GHQ sought to rectify this. Uh, they published writings such as History of the Pacific War. They had a radio series, uh, Now It Can Be Told, where they talked about uh, war history, things that had gone on including Japanese military uh, atrocities such as uh, the Nanking Massacre. Uh, the, the Allied powers also held a military tribunal, the International Military Tribunal for the Far East. This is commonly known as the Tokyo Trials, uh, in which they tried Japanese leaders, military leaders, uh, and their wartime responsibility. And in this process, uncovered many military documents, uh, conducted interviews with military, uh, high-level military leaders trying to determine, you know, what happened during the war, causes of the war, and then to assign responsibility and guilt. Uh, the, Japan, the occupation informed Japan about Japanese war atrocities to a certain extent, but at the same time, uh, they prohibited criticism of the Allies and censored information on the atomic bombings of Hiroshima and Nagasaki. So there was kind of this one-sided uh, historical critique going on here, and war crimes were, were not looked at uh, or judged equally. The occupation also promoted the idea that Japan had been hijacked by a small group of military leaders who had deceived the emperor and dragged Japan into a reckless war. Obviously, this was a great simplification or oversimplification. Um, average Japanese people <clears throat> and uh, Japanese bureaucracy, for instance, was much more involved at every level of society uh, in, in wartime planning and wartime, the wartime economy and uh, uh, in carrying out the war. Uh, so it wasn't just this small group who had deceived the emperor. The emperor himself uh, declared war on the U.S. and the U.K. through imperial decree. So it's, it's kind of a stretch to, uh, to, to when, as the Allies were promoting this narrative, but nevertheless, uh, this is uh, what the narrative that they promoted. After Japan gained its independence in 1952 with the signing of the San Francisco Treaty, uh, there was a revival of nationalism, uh, Japanese nationalism to a certain extent. Uh, the cabinet of Prime Minister, under Prime Minister Yoshida, for instance, transformed uh, the police force into the self-defense forces. So um, Japan's kind of de facto military, even though it's supposed to be only for self-defense purposes. 
the same year, 1952, uh, the government held the first national memorial ceremony for the war dead, and it was focused on a commemoration uh, of the war dead, Ken Sho, um, uh, and not just you know mourning and remorse and recompense. Uh, the government also started to give uh, financial aid to former military families and war bereaved, uh, and and also former military uh, personnel. At the same time, there were many efforts within Japanese society to uncover uh, Japanese war crimes uh, and to critically confront the history of Japanese wartime aggression. Some examples of this would be, for instance, uh, in 1951, the Japan-China Friendship Association held a memorial service for uh, 586 Chinese forced laborers who uh, were killed as they were forced to work in these mines in Japan, the Hanaoka Mines. Um, a group of Japanese soldiers who had been held as prisoners of war in China um, but then were repatriated to Japan later and formed a group which is abbreviated as, uh, their name is abbreviated as Chukiden. Uh, they published a book called Three Alls, the Sanko, um, uh, discussing Japanese uh, war crimes and atrocities committed by the Japanese military. Um, Park Kyung-sik uh, published the record of Korean forced mobilization in 1965. So there were especially, these are just some examples focusing on forced labor, but attempts to um, critically confront the history of Japanese wartime aggression. In popular culture, uh, there, were, there were two sides especially to this. There were revision, revisionist accounts on the one hand, such as Hayashi Fusao's 1963, The Affirmative Thesis on the Greater East Asian War, Daito Asenso Koteidon, uh, in which he basically argued that the war was justified, that Japan had been right. And these competed with, on the other hand, anti-war pacifist depictions, such as Gomi Kawashunpei's uh, The Human Condition, Ibise Masaji's Black Rain. Uh, but definitely the former accounts of, by these revisionists were in the minority in popular culture. Uh, the Human Condition and Black Rain were much more popular, they're still, they remain popular uh, today. In the 1970s, uh, mass opposition to the Viet, there was mass opposition to the Vietnam War within Japan and very strong anti-US sentiment. Uh, and one group to oppose the war was led by writer, intellectual activist, uh, Oda Makoto. And he and some others formed this group that was called Beiheiden uh, to oppose the war and assist U.S. soldiers who were uh, trying to desert, or to convince U.S. soldiers to desert, um, and to not to give up fighting. Uh, and they were very critical in their uh, analysis uh, of how Japan was basically being used as a base uh, to launch, for the U.S. to launch the Vietnam War, and Japan was lending various kinds of support for the war, and they saw this as a repetition of past victimization of how Japan had um, victimized Asians in the past Asia-Pacific War, too. And so Oda Makoto said that this kind of led to a realization that we ourselves may have been in the past, could become in the future, or actually are at present victimizers as well as victims, and that this is a prerequisite to effective denunciation of allied hypocrisy. So in other words, he's saying if you really want to critique the Vietnam War, we have to look at what Japan is doing uh, now. You know, they're not just, they're not victims in this case, they're actually lending support and victimizing others. And moreover, this is kind of a repetition then of what happened in the past. Uh, the journalist Honda Katsuichi at the same time wrote the series uh, Travels in China that was published in the Asai Shimbun and was mainly interviews with Chinese victims of uh, uh, Japanese wartime aggression. And this caused a huge stir uh, within Japanese society. And also going on at this time, the historian Ienaga Sabudo 
is has been suing the the Japanese government for censoring school history textbooks uh, and basically arguing that the Ministry of Education's textbook screening process, where it, it either approves uh, or doesn't approve which textbooks can be published, is unconstitutional. And he also argues, importantly, you know, that this, this process has um, kind of stymied critical investigation of Japanese wartime aggression and atrocities such as the Nanking Massacre. Uh, in the 1980s and 1982, uh, the Japanese government uh, angered China and Korea, especially when it censored school history textbooks and uh, changed, for instance, the words invasion, a shinbyaku, to advance, shinshutsu. And this caused a great international backlash and it forced the Japanese government to, uh, to basically go back on this, to retract um, its changes, and then also to issue uh, the neighboring country clause, Kinnin Shokoku Joko, uh, which said, uh, in part, and I read it here, the Japanese government and the Japanese people are deeply aware of the fact that acts by our country in the past caused tremendous suffering and damage to the peoples of Asian countries, including the Republic of Korea and China, and have followed the path of a pacifist state with remorse and determination that such acts must never be repeated. From the perspective of building friendship and goodwill with neighboring countries, Japan will pay due attention to these criticisms from China and Korea and make cor corrections to textbooks uh, at the government's responsibility. And this was a the official title in English was a Statement by Chief Cabinet Secretary Kiichi Miyazawa on History Textbooks, uh, issued in August 1982. Also in the 1980s, um, in 1985, Prime Minister Nakasone um, went to worship in official capacity at Yasukuni Shrine, but like the textbook issue, this attracted a strong international criticism and backlash and it forced the Japanese government to uh, declare in 1986 that it would not no longer conduct such official worship at the shrine, and moreover, it would consider the surrounding Asian countries' feelings. In that same year, in a diet questioning, in response to questioning uh, in the diet, Nakasone clarified his personal view that it was the Asia-Pacific War was indeed uh, a war of aggression, Shinryaku Teki. So these events, uh, especially the textbook issue, led to school history textbooks and publishers being emboldened to question Japan's war responsibility. And so then from this period, there was increasing coverage of uh, wartime atrocities such as the Nan Nanking Massacre, uh, Unit 731, and uh, the Comfort Women. In this kind of reached a peak in the 1990s, and, and in 1995 was the 50th anniversary of the end of the Asia-Pacific War, so a very symbolic uh, year as well. And it was a, a peak, but it was also kind of a turning point. Um, so, for instance, in 1993, Chief Cabinet Secretary Kono Yohei admitted that the Japanese government's role in running comfort women's system and apologized for this. And that same year, Prime Minister Hosokawa uh, admitted that it was a war of aggression, and successive Japanese prime ministers in their August 15th uh, commemoration speeches for the end of the war have generally uh, continued after this, this uh, trend, although this changes later, as I will show in a minute. Uh, in 1995, Prime Minister Murayama also uh, issued an apology, and this was called the Fusen Ketsugi. In, also in the 1990s, an NHK survey found that a majority of people, more than half of Japanese public, uh, agreed that the Asia-Pacific War was a war of aggression. But all of these changes and admissions of guilt and responsibility from high-ranking politicians, as well as uh, many victims of Japanese wartime aggression and aggressors coming forward and admitting their roles, all of these things prompted a huge backlash from right-wing historical revisionists. And one such uh, 
person who attracted a lot of attention was a, a Tokyo University professor of education, Fujioka Nobukatsu. And he formed the Liberal View of History Study Group, Jiyushugi Shikan Kenkyukai. And in 1997, the Japanese Society for History Textbook Reform, Atadashi Bekushio Kyokasho Tsukurukai. Uh, that same year, there was the formation of another right-wing political group, uh, the Japan Conference, or Nihon Kaigi, and all of these groups sought to basically erase the history of Japanese war crimes to portray the Asia-Pacific War as a, quote, just war of, quote, self-defense for, quote, Asian liberation. Then, entering the 2000s to the present, uh, in fact, the Tsukurukai and some of the other right-wing revisionists were at first not so successful. Their textbook failed to capture a large share of the market. But, at the same time, they did put pressure on other publishers to self-censor their coverage of controversial events so that mention of the Nanking Massacre and the Comfort Women starts to slowly drop out of other textbooks. So they did have kind of a strong influence, paradoxically. Then, moreover, there's been a strong revival of right-wing nationalism in general under the successive administrations of Prime Minister Abe Shinzo in 2006 and 7, and 2012 to the present. Abe and other members of the uh, Liberal Democratic Party uh, are members of the Japan Conference, um, in his 2015 August speech commemorating the end of the war, Abe uh, made no apology for the war, was very circumspect about whether it was a, a war of aggression in general or not. Um, and then issues uh, such as, uh, or problems such as a revision of history textbooks, and sorry, this is a misspelling, but should be a revision of the Constitution, especially Article 9, have uh, gained a lot of traction during this time, while at the same time, more you know, people on the far right, uh, Tamogami Toshio Hyakuta Naoki, who's a writer, um, was head of NHK for a while, uh, wrote a, a famous book, novel, that was made into a movie about um, uh, Toko pilots uh, called A.N. No Zero, uh, and uh, Sakurai Yoshiko, and these people, um, these far-right people, are then basically denying that any of these Japanese atrocities happened in the first place. They denounce what they see as this Tokyo Trials view of history. Um, they say that Japan was right and just in fighting the war, and they say it was for Asian liberation, etc. And then, along with this, um, decades of economic downturn and neoliberal austerity um, are, it seems, perhaps uh, forcing more and more people to turn to this right-wing populism, right-wing nationalism, and their right-wing uh, kind of racist far-right groups like the Japan First Party, Nihon Daichi To, uh, have also started to emerge and be very vocal um, and holding protests and rallies outside train stations, etc. And so these have also become kind of um, this really racist far-right groups and denialism have uh, um, started to also become very vocal. So some conclusions, um, reflecting back on this, what, can, what are some things that we can say uh, in general about trends in, in on Japanese war memory. Um, first, Japanese war memories are complex. Uh, they have ranged from of being fiercely critical of the war, the military, uh, the emperor system, uh, to, on the other hand, the historical being historical revisionist, um, which would then deny uh, Japanese wartime atrocities and aggression. So there's there's a broad range. A lot of people are you know fall somewhere on the spectrum, probably not on either uh, extreme end, but somewhere in the middle. Um, the other thing to note is that memories uh, have changed as time has gone on, and in response to various socio-historical backgrounds, such as an event such as the Vietnam War, 
economic downturns, and international pressures. And thirdly, uh, it seems that right-wing revisionism and politics in general are increasing across the globe in response to crises of capitalism and climate change. Um, but opposition also remains high to this, and progressive groups uh, are continuing to seek future peace and equity based on critical investigations of past crimes and injustices. So where we will go from here remains to be seen, and I would say all of this is a part of an, an ongoing project uh, seeking uh, further all kinds of, of equity and economic justice, social justice uh, for different groups. So anyway, I hope this uh, video lecture has been uh, enlightening, and I hope that we have gained uh, a little bit better understanding of Japanese memories of the Asian Pacific War and how they have, have changed. Uh, and in future lectures, we'll be looking at um, wartime memories and accounts uh, uh, in Jap not only Japan, but also uh, from China and Korea as well. So... Stay tuned.